So hello everybody, I'm very excited to be um, holding my first interview. Thank you, Sharon, for trusting me to do that. <laughs> my pleasure, happy to be your first guinea pig. <laughs> thank you, thank you, so amazing. Oh, I wanted to say to everybody, yeah, Sharon and I met on a beautiful platform for women's entrepreneurs called One Roof and uh, highly recommend it. And so that's how we met and we're collaborating, helping women together and so, First, what I would like to say is, this is Sharon, and I'm going to get her to introduce details about herself. She's a health coach, and I'm going to ask Sharon now, well, um, first tell us what you do, and then after that, I'm going to ask you to share a bit about how you got to doing what you're doing. So how do you help women right now in your life? So probably my ideal client is someone who is like I used to be, that really busy person who's trying to juggle a career or managing a business. They might have children, might be also looking after aging parents. You know what it's like. Like we're really, really busy these days. I find that there's two groups of people. There's one group of people who know what they probably should be doing when it comes to things like managing stress, prioritizing self-care, eating and fueling their bodies, exercising. So they know what they should be doing, but then maybe just not doing it. And then there's others who are confused. They're a bit overwhelmed by all the information out there. They feel really stuck. And sometimes they're not quite sure where to start, particularly if you kind of get to that point where it feels like nothing's going right. It's like, you know, maybe you've stopped exercising. Maybe you know that you're not eating as well as you, you could be. Um, maybe, you know, stress is really high and you're not getting enough sleep and all those things. And sometimes it can feel really overwhelming and, and it feels like a big job to even just get started. Mm -hmm. So I work with women to figure out where they're at right now. Like what are their challenges? But where would they love to be? If they were waking up and feeling their healthiest, happiest, mo most vibrant self, what would that actually look like for them? So we get really crystal clear on what they want. And then we look at choosing one place to start. So I work with people to, we do a little um, analysis tool, which is looking at sort of five areas of health. So we look at uh, eating for energy. We look at exercise or movement, as I like to call it, because some people tell me they hate exercise. <laughs> Um, we look at managing stress, we look at sleep, we look at self-care, but also a really big part of that is our mindset. And I also teach people how to create habits. So we look at what, what am I struggling with most at the moment? Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes people will say, at the moment, the biggest thing is I haven't exercised for six years. I need to get back into exercise. Or it might be stress is up to here mm -hmm. and I just need to learn some better coping mechanisms. Or it might be I was talking to someone the other day and she said, I don't eat breakfast. I was in meetings from 9.30 till 5. All I had was a muesli bar in my um, my bag. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so that's a, there's no judgment. It's like, okay, cool. Let's figure out what can we do. And we just choose one place to start. Because often what happens when people decide they need to make a change, they go, right, I need to eat healthier. I need to be moving more, getting more sleep. And they try and change everything. And it's all too much too soon. And, of course, they can't stick with it. So it's really about helping them find a place to start and making small changes that they can manage and sustain over the long term, not doing some crazy thing that's going to be tough and, and not part of a healthy lifestyle. So I'm really about helping people to create a healthy, sustainable lifestyle that will work around their unique lifestyle. Because one thing that I've really found over the last eight years is we're all different. We've all got such different lifestyles. Yeah. Some people have children, some don't. The age of our children differ. Some people work, some don't. Some do night shift. Like it's crazy the, the differences in our lifestyles these days. So it's got to be something that will work for them because what suits one person might not suit another. I agree. And that's what I, what I do with my clients as well and the women I work with because otherwise it's not going to be successful. It's not going to even be fun. And you ideally want it to seem... <laughs> easy and fun and doable so that we get to see the results and we can go from there I mean everything you describe is 100% awesome I love that because that's works that that's exactly it so what I love about what you just said is that so in a nutshell when a woman comes to you she will have a chat with you and then you'll you will find out her priorities now she wants to feel because often women aren't even connected with what they really want because life is so busy they don't even have a chance to think oh I wish I could feel like this it doesn't even so first connecting with that and then figuring out what is one step into that direction I'm guessing and then the yes. second and now my question for you would be uh, just because it flows 
So do you um, offer one-on-one -on -one and programs and like like a one-year package? I mean, that's what I do. I'm just curious. I, I don't know how you do it. Yeah, so I work with people for 90 days because I think that's a really reasonable time frame to actually to start to see some changes. And in fact, actually with um, a group coaching program that I've just done, really around that nine, 10 week mark was when they started to really get some good traction. And particularly if people have, you know, you can get good results starting within a week. Like if you start teaching people, for example, how to eat to fuel their bodies, within a week they can start feeling better. But to really start to get some noticeable changes, it is kind of around that eight, nine, 10 week mark, depending on what people have been doing previously. And then, yeah, after that 90 days, it's really up to them whether they want to continue. You know, I've got one client, for example, I'm working with, we just do six week blocks. Others are on a subscription monthly program. They can stop at any time because I think one of the big things is that accountability is a really big thing and support. And I think people, you know, health coaching, I think in Australia is still something people are a little bit sceptical about. I know in the US, people have got coaches for everything. I've got clients who <laughs> just love it. You know, it's like they can't get enough of it. But I think really where it helps is, you know, we, we all have great intentions and personal accountability is the ultimate goal. But when we're first starting, we usually need someone to, to give us that support, like to sort of be your best friend, to mm -hmm. be there to sort of cheer you on. If you've, if you've gotten off track, you know, I think one of the big things is that we all get off track. You know, they have a, there's a week where we get sick or work's crazy busy and we didn't do the things that we said we'd do. It's never about judgment. It's about mm -hmm. going, okay, but what did we do that week? Because it's actually amazing, like particularly if you're someone who is used to getting results quickly or you're a high achiever, Mm -hmm. that sort of people are so busy looking at the five things that they didn't do or where they want to get to they forget that they did 95 things during the week so it's really about being able to say I always start my calls with right what wins have we had this week I remember one week one of my clients said on the call I'm here I've showed up <laughs> that, was, That's it. that yeah. was her only win for the week and that was okay yes yes it was off the rails it doesn't matter it's going okay cool Let's look at how what happened. How can we get back on track? Because otherwise what happens is if people are left to their own devices, that's it. They end up in just stopping. Oh, that's cool. So I think that support, but also the accountability, like knowing that there is someone else, you know what it's like. If you go into the gym and your friend's meeting you there, you're more likely to go than if you're just going uh -huh. by yourself. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of. I think that the, I find the, the calls are the, the thing that helps to hold people accountable until they can hold themselves yes. accountable. And until it's, it's really become about, a habit. Yeah, knowing when to let go and for them to let go as well. I, I don't believe in coach dependency, um, but I always want to be here to, you know, support people till they feel like they can take the training wheels off and ride. On their own you speak exactly my soul exactly yeah. how I speak. I'm looking at you going wow this is exactly how I feel and what I've noticed works it actually works if they're free to move on they're also free to have the support it's a unique system and it is about focusing on how much we actually do achieve and that old habit of thinking oh my goodness I didn't do this one thing and spiraling down that doesn't need to happen with us around or in your case you you can just say no you did really well remember mm -hmm. that and one day not eating the way you planned so what and that little con bit of contact makes all the difference doesn't it to know absolutely that's okay that's even normal you're not yeah. a robot right, right. and um, I also think too people put I think people think healthy living has to be hard and they put all these really big um, expectations and they think that it means you can't have fun and you can't still yeah. enjoy life. And in fact, actually, I was talking to a client this morning. She's actually um, temporarily living in the US. Um, in fact, actually, she's from One Roof. And she said, I love my wine. She said, but, you know, I can take or leave coffee. And it was like, well, that's the thing. Sometimes we just go, well, if you can take or leave the coffee, Mm -hmm. leave the coffee and still enjoy your glass of wine and I think if we it's when people do that whole all or nothing mindset it's like oh, I can't, no chocolate no wine no coffee no fun you know no, that's nothing. when people give up because it's not sustainable to live like that it's not and it's not balanced either no. and so it's about and once again it's not for me to say what someone's lifestyle should look like they've got to figure it out for them and you know I've had clients who eat chocolate every single day now some people can break that habit but very few people can break that habit going cold turkey but it might be going well let's try and cut back you know whether it's wine or coffee or 
alcohol or whatever it is, um, chocolate, just saying, all right, if you're eating chocolate every night, maybe we try and cut down to five times a week and then we slowly do mm -hmm. it. It's amazing how people can, I like people to be in control of their decisions around food rather than food being in control of them. Yes. Yeah, that's a really also, good one. Um, I'm sure you work with this too. Often it's not so much giving something up, but maybe replacing it with a different yeah. habit or maybe a glass of a small glass of water or uh, something else that's a healthy replacement yeah. instead of the chocolate maybe every day. That's what I find works well. Yeah, I give people wicked recipes for <laughs> yummy things that can replace chocolate that are actually really delicious but healthy. Mm. Yeah. And I think too, um, you know, like we a lot of us have got emotional connections with food so it's really figuring out where do I maybe use food as reward or where is it just a habit that I walk in after work and the first thing I do is open up the fridge or it might be mm -hmm. eating when we're stressed or eating when we're emotional you know we're sad or lonely and mm -hmm. part of it is actually starting to be okay with exploring what's going on for me here and mm -hmm. honestly it's amazing when people start to uncover what's behind the eating and then exactly like you said, replacing it. And sometimes it's not necessarily replacing it with food. If someone's eating because they're sad or lonely, it's about going, well, how can we actually nourish you yeah. more? Maybe it's a bath. Yeah. Maybe it's buying flowers or reading a book or even just having the awareness can shift it. I'm noticing, just noticing this is what I do because of that. And that's what I actually want. And it shifts. It's yeah. so amazing. So it's about becoming conscious of our habits, right? And being like a little detective, which is exactly how I work as well. And just going, wow, that's what I do. I wonder why that's been working for me, but I want to shift it now. And then do you work uh, with women to find out where it comes from? Or does it like, for example, if it was uh, a program they've inherited from childhood where every time they were a good girl, maybe they got lollies. <laughs> what Do they come all the way? Way that that far do they walk down that path with you as well yeah I mean I do one of the things I talk about is conditioning so where maybe like I know for me I was conditioned to eat everything on my plate mm, and, maybe, uh, and even now I'm acutely aware of it it's still like in fact actually I was out for dinner with a girlfriend last night and we went for Thai food and it, it was even worse like when I was being when I was brought up like if we went out for dinner it was like eat everything there like don't leave any money on the table kind of thing and one wow. of the dishes still had some food in it and I was consciously looking at it going it's okay we don't need to eat it it's okay and and that's mm -hmm. the thing like and and we need to be aware of those things and learn how to cope with them so um yes and I've got many stories of people where you know they've been like you said when they've been a good girl they get food or there was you know there's other stories where you know bad things have happened in families and food was used to comfort or comfort and oh. so then it's about coming to the awareness of that it's not about necessarily having to relive through the experiences but sometimes going oh my gosh yeah wow every time that happened mum would buy us cakes and lollies and and food and so on and mm -hmm. wow maybe I need to find another solution for when that sort of thing happens it doesn't necessarily involve food so yeah so it's about because sometimes when we can unlock what's behind what we're doing those habits and I'm all about habits uh, then we can actually then free ourselves from that and be more in control because sometimes when we're not mindful of where it's coming from because it's really deep um, just... as much as we're trying to change the habit and do something different that pattern is hardwired in so we just need to go oh wow okay great that's what it's from now let's actually shift that and just unlocking that um, is, is usually the key well and that's actually what my work is when people can't shift it and they need to really go back and they've maybe even forgotten a trauma you know uh, where they were controlled around food which is so massive and then going back where I do the regression or the, the mild hypnosis and also a bit of NLP to really um, rephrase things and re-empower and really get to the root cause, then it's totally gone. Um, and that's super powerful because in, uh, the food is about survival. It's about how we interact with our parents. It's the first relationship with love and how love is. is. And I often, I have to say, as a parent myself of three kids, I 
I have observed many times women saying, or maybe even men to their kids, if you're a good girl or good boy, I'll give you a lolly or we'll have the ice cream. And I'm thinking, oh no, they're going to have to unwire that one day because it's such a belief that this food is going to reward me. And therefore I feel love and I feel complete. And therefore the body doesn't even question that or the mind doesn't even question it anymore. Mm, and it's, totally like, right. it's so powerful. And that's why I think there's a strong link with what we do because I would go to a certain level with people, but I think that, you know, some people might need to go a deeper level with, you know, uncovering some of those issues if they can't sort of make those connections consciously themselves. And, you know, that's where I'll sort of stop and that's where I would refer to someone Mm -hmm. else. If someone wants to do that sort of deeper work to shift trauma and so on because that's not my area of expertise. So I definitely know where my limit is. (laughs) And I think that's awesome. That's where each of us women help other women, which is my passion. And everyone brings their their own experience to it and what they really sit comfortably with. And then the person sitting opposite you feels that and straight away can heal much quicker because they know you get it. You're comfortable with it. You've heard everything and you can hold them to really safely walk through it, which brings me to the next question. So you work with people internationally, interstate, not just in Perth and WA where you are. I'm pretty sure you're in Perth. Yes. I am in Perth. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, No, I do. I've got clients in the US, um, which I love. I've got clients interstate. So yeah, I do. My, it's actually really funny when I started coaching. I was like, oh no, I definitely want to do face to face, but it and I guess COVID awesome. kind of put a big end to that. And then you start to go, oh, actually, online is really good and it's convenient for people. So yeah, so most yeah. of my coaching, in fact, actually, a hundred percent of my coaching now is online, yeah. um, which is great because it means that you know you can sort of do it across different time zones and different countries, uh, which is awesome. And you have a Facebook group where people can support. Now, wait a minute. I wanted to also ask you, is your specialty now menopause? I know you do a broad spectrum, but is your special niche menopause, would you say? Or how does that work with you right now? Not not necessarily. Um, You know, probably my ideal client is, you know, someone who's like me, as I said, that busy woman, which, you know, I'm nearly 55. So, um, but I I guess I've met a lot of women and menopause has been a big issue. I went through it at 44 Mm -hmm. and I had absolutely no idea what was going on. And it just became... A topic of conversation for a lot of people and so I started a group um, just to really share information and I mean I've got a great network of health professionals like yourself um, you know I've got an over 50s um, personal trainer friend and you know lots of different people who can really um, I just wanted a place where people could come together and actually share their knowledge and, and help provide women with more information to support them on their menopause journey so I wouldn't necessarily say it's my specialty or my niche um, it's just that I guess a lot of my clients are around a similar age and so it's a topic that I love to be able to help women through because I think a lot of the coaching work that I do um, is relevant for where they're at in that um, menopause journey. And and having the equipment not just uh, through diet and nutrition the equipment or being equipped to emotionally also embrace the beauty of it a lot of people say oh menopause is so bad and this and I'm thinking can we turn this around to it's our next face and there's a beauty in that as well I know for some people it's really a tough journey but also as you would do how to make it uh, mild how to navigate whatever's going on for them huge because I know so many women that would just say I've just suffered through it and thank god it's over when you're in the middle when you're getting there and it's actually massive so I'm well, so- it's a big part of your life as well you know it can go on for up to you know six to ten years so yes you know if you sort of waiting for it to be over you've just wished away 10 years of your life so I think it's more yes. about like a lot of it's your mindset mm-hmm. you know what you seem to focus on when it comes to that I think the thing is it's going to happen so you might as well just try to find a way to actually get your mindset in a good place about it and yeah I mean there are nights where you're going to wake up with hot sweats and in fact actually I was laughing with someone today about we were laughing about what's our most embarrassing menopause story um but just being able to share that stuff and you know, we all survive and we move Love on that. but it's it's really learning from the mistakes of others like I actually with most story that I was sharing with her was that I was actually doing a coaching with a, a, a male um, client in one of the big mining companies in Perth an executive and I was sitting across from him and it was winter and of course I've gone dressed in a beautiful cashmere jumper because it was hot I'm sorry it was freezing cold outside but of course you walk from the freezing cold outside into an office Mm -hmm. And the temperature is very different. Anyway, in the middle of this coaching, I could feel 
the heat rising. I could feel my face getting red and I could feel the beads of sweat starting to break out on my forehead. And I'm sure this guy was thinking, oh my gosh, like this woman's going to combust any minute. But just that, that was, I learned the hard way about the importance of choosing the different fabrics and layering and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And if people can be a little bit pre armed with information, um, and tips and things I just I think because I didn't really talk to anyone about it as I said I was 44 I didn't really know what was happening until I was well and truly into it and just I mean that's over 10 years ago I don't know for whatever reason I just didn't feel comfortable to just start talking to people about it and so I just suffered through figured it out I had a really good Chinese doctor and she'd helped me with through pregnancies and all sorts of things so I went to her and that was fantastic but I think being able to share with people and help them to be informed to be able to be surrounded by other people and know it's normal have a bit of a laugh yeah. ask questions get the support you need um yeah there were some things so many things I wish I'd known that I suffered through um mm-hmm. it would have been so much better if I'd had people to talk to and when you say Chinese doctor you mean uh Chinese medicine acupuncture herbs that kind of thing yeah. yes yeah oh, and in fact actually in that menopause group um, the first, so we've sort of started this topic, real conversations, and you'll be doing one with me, which is fantastic. I'm really excited because sleep's a big thing for a lot of people, regardless of where they're at, you know, with menopause. But um, just going back to what you're saying about menopause, um, from a Chinese perspective, they talk about it as your second spring. And mm, so, I like that. Um, yeah, and seeing it as a time of renewing energy and an opportunity for creativity because it's, you know, usually by then if you've had children, it's time where you actually start to rediscover yourself and mm-hmm. and be able to spend more time on yourself. And that's where you can have those opportunities for more creative things. So yes. um, I love how they describe that um, as that second spring. I thought it was a really nice way of thinking about menopause. I love that. And I think that they don't have so many hormonal problems in the traditional Chinese context. Us Westerners have more of that. And um, I also feel it's like a second um, big chapter and it's got so much beauty to it. And Mm. um, to be able to support women and laugh about it, I can't think of anything better. Today, I saw some women and they were just laughing together and they were good friends. And there's nothing like that energy and just laugh about everything. So I love what you do and your energy around it. And um, So did you want to share anything around your journey that brought you to where you are now helping women with this? So I know you said you were the burnt out one. And so what happened? You were burnt out and you you decided that's not the way. And then what happened? I would love to hear that. Yeah. So I, um, I spent 25 years in corporate. So my background's human resources and change management. I did a lot of leadership development and coaching and so on. So I kind of already had that skill there. Um, But my girls, it was all fine when they were in primary school and I was always able to work around their schedules. Um, I was quite fortunate, really. Um, I was doing, I did 10 years of consulting once I had my girls, so I could sort of fit it in with them. But when the older one went to high school and was doing a professional ballet program, I just found that I was running around like crazy and she was doing competitive swimming. So I'd be leaving home Mm -hmm. at 5am. I'd often have to be packed with their breakfasts, their lunches, their school bags, their ballet bags, afternoon tea. And sometimes she wouldn't come home till nine o'clock. Sometimes I even had to have her dinner with me. Wow. When we left at 5 a.m., I'd drop them to school, go to work, rush to pick up one, be running in, come out to the car, go get the other one, race to ballet, come home. I, yeah. I remember one day I took a photo of my front step with school uniforms, swimming bags, school bags, afternoon tea, wow. like insane. And I just kept on going and on the surface, I mean, people did used to go, say, oh, you're that crazy mum that always running around in your high heel shoes <laughs> into school. Um, and, it, and I sort of thought, oh, yeah, very funny. But I remember starting, that was kind of like that thing, like, oh, yeah, like, what am I doing? Mm-hmm. And I, I, I appeared on the surface like I was coping, but underneath I really wasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, I was not prioritising sleep. I'd get five hours sleep a night. Mm-hmm. I would like stress was like through the roof and it was it was the the stress of the running around really you know we'd be driving to ballet and she'd be like oh I forgot my ballet tights it's like oh my god like what are we gonna do back yes you can be worried because you know we're not going to get there on time like everything was just rush 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 Mm -hmm. the whole time Mm -hmm. and I started to feel really disconnected Mm -hmm. um self-care was like what even is that 
Um, <laughs> and even though I would always eat a really healthy dinner, you know, there were lots of times when I'd be skipping meals. The one thing I've never, ever compromised on is exercise. Mm -hmm. Like that is my, that was, that would always go in my diary first mm -hmm. of all. Mm -hmm. And so I never, but there were lots of things that I didn't do. I didn't ever eat unhealthy food. I just often would skip meals. I might have coffee and a muesli bar or something like that. So, so I kind of got to this point where I thought, you know what, like, um, and two people separately, health professionals said, if you keep going like you are, you're going to end up having a breakdown with a diagnosis or whatever. Adrenal and, fatigue, yes, all that. Yes, exactly. I think I already had it. And it was just kind of fortunate. I was consulting at um, Fortescue Metals Group at the time in change management. And on that day, they got rid of a thousand consultants in one day. Mm -hmm. So it was like the universe said, right, if you can't make a change, I'm going to force you to make a change. And so that was honestly, it was hard at the time, but it was the biggest blessing yeah. because sometimes we know we get stuck on that hamster wheel where we're just going, going. I used to think I want to do something else. I used to actually go, I'm just going to go get a job in retail and just work part time. So I just don't have this stress. Mm -hmm. And I used to think, what, what else can I do? Like, I just, this is all I know, you know, we can really get stuck in our own head sometimes mm -hmm. and not be able to see a way out. So I started an online health and wellness business and then did my health coaching course because I sort of figured like I went through that whole career thing of, you know, what skills have I got that I could take from corporate on my career and use with other people and what am I passionate about? So I already had the coaching skills and I've always been passionate about health and wellness and so mm -hmm. I was able to then combine the two and that's where I am now and I've been doing that for eight years. That is a great story. And I love everything you share because so many women watching this will be able to identify with that, running around everywhere, starting to feel it's not working and then wondering, why was I let go of? And I say, usually if they're talking to me, well, it's probably because deep down you needed it and then you, and you just got a bit of help. You need to do something else, the best mm -hmm. thing ever. And, and it's good to celebrate it. Whoever's listening to that, is there something in their life they are getting the sign they might want to change? And do they want to wait for them to push you along? Or do you want to take action and, and start to adjust now? Um, it's so powerful. You've shared so much gold in this in this session. I'm mm -hmm. going to ask you, are there three things you want to share or maybe refer them to a place where they can get more information from you so they can feel empowered before we finish off today? Um, well, I actually just did a story just before we got on this call, um, just a little bit about goals, you know, whether it might even be a simple goal. Like sometimes people will say, I want to snack healthier or I want to move my body more or I want to make more time for self-care. Mm -hmm. And I just shared four tips. So maybe if I can just share those four tips really quickly. Oh, so I think the first thing is sometimes we set what I call free range goals. We, we sort of set a goal, but we're not really committed to it. It's a bit loose. So I always say the first thing with any goal is you have to have a decided heart. Like you have to have decided, do you know what? I'm really committed and I really want this. So that's the first thing with any goal. So even if it's something as simple as, I want to snack healthier. It's like, okay, I really have decided right now I'm going to snack healthier. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's number one. The second thing is you've got to get clear on your why. Like, why do you really want that? Like, why is that important? Because otherwise what happens is we get really busy and it's very easy to go, oh, you know what? Like, it's just easy to grab a chocolate from the chocolate box today. I think I won't worry about it. I'll start again tomorrow. So it's getting clear on what's the why behind this. Like, what? why is that important to me? What's going to be the benefit if I do snack healthier? Maybe it's that you're going to have more energy to get through the afternoon. Maybe it's that you do, you're not feeling great in your clothes right now or in your body. And so, you know, that it might be having a photo of that lean, fit, healthy, vibrant you that you're working towards or whatever it is. So that why is really important. Um, and then it's having a plan. So I think otherwise what happens is we have these great intentions. Not the ideas. Mm -hmm. I think this woman on the weekend thought, oh my gosh, like this is annoying. But I said to her, okay, great. Let's have a look at what, what's gone off the rails with the snacking and what we can do to get back on. Because she was doing really well and then it was figuring out, okay, do you know what it was? Mm -hmm. The simple thing. She was um, um, stepping in for her boss, so she had to go sit at a boss's desk instead of her own desk. It was the simplest thing that all she needed to do was bring her snacks from her desk to his desk, but she never did that. And so because they weren't there, 
she would just go grab whatever snacks were in the lunchroom or on the front counter, even though nothing much else had changed except her wow. location. Mm. You had to just go, okay, well, let's have a look at what snacks are you going to eat? How are you actually going to, do you need some recipes? Um, what shopping do you need to do? How do you need to build that into your planning on the weekend when you're getting your food? Mm -hmm. How are you going to get those snacks from home to work? Like little things, but it's the little things, those little details that so I just helped her to make a plan it only took like 10 minutes to mm. make the plan of exactly what she was going to do how she was going to do that so that mm. she could be in place so that's the third thing is drill down and have a plan otherwise that goal just remains a good intention and then the fourth thing is really thinking about the accountability and as we were saying earlier you know personal accountability ultimately is the goal but sometimes when we're just getting started we need someone else to hold us accountable it might be a friend at work it might be a family member it might be a tracker. I'm a huge fan of trackers. It's like a little kid, you know, ticking off, you know. Um, but just something to hold you accountable um, yes. to that goal. It would be something else really important. And I, and I guess, you know, that's where a coach can come in, you know, that support and that accountability if, if that's what people need. But, you know, it might be that they can find it within their own, you know, network or family unit. So that'd be my four Love tips. Around the world. Starts with a decision, uh, have a strong why, get your action plan and set up your accountability. Brilliant. So anyone listening, you can pause this video anytime, write it down and feel it out, explore it. It is so, it can be fun and small things make a big difference, right? So um, oh, absolutely. I'm a huge fan of The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy, one of the best books I've ever read, but it is, it's all those little things that yeah. do add up and, and big change doesn't need big action. It just needs a series of consistent small actions every day. And those mm -hmm. results do compound over time for sure. They do because that shift attracts more and it empowers you to feel I can do that. And sometimes it can happen so naturally. Mm -hmm. People feel it's effortless. How amazing because of that small, well, first commitment and alignment and then doing it. So now you are, let me know your website or where people can find you. You said, I think earlier it was Instagram and Facebook. Well, yeah, what Instagram, is um, I'm just Health with Sharon on Instagram, uh, on LinkedIn, I'm just Sharon Gleason and my website, SharonGleason.com. Right. So was there anything else? No. And yes, I'll look forward to coming into your group and giving a talk on sleep and collaborating. And yes, I hope everyone that's watching this will check out what you're doing and uh, and just get those little nuggets even from my posts and apply them. The more we as women rise and enjoy and realize it can be playful and fun the more we're all going to influence each other positively. Like, isn't that so? Because then our children will observe, observe it, our friends will observe it, and it creates that butterfly effect as well. So I good. think that's a massive one for, for those women who have got children is being mindful that your kids are watching you and the role model that you're setting for your children. But I just want to say one thing too. Mm -hmm. if you haven't ever done one of Sabine's meditations. Oh, my gosh. She did one on Monday on our networking group and it was only maybe about five seven minutes mm -hmm. and honestly like I can often really struggle with meditation it's not one of my strengths but it was amazing so um yes if you haven't ever done one of her meditations do one because oh it honestly made such a difference to my focus and my productivity that day I was actually really blown away I'm so, so glad to hear that. that I cannot wait to hear your sleep tips Dying Thank you so much. I don't need them. I'm the best sleeper in the world, but I know so many people who struggle with falling asleep, with staying asleep, um, waking up in the night, waking up feeling groggy and so on in the morning. So exactly. I'm really looking forward to that. And I also feel what's actually important, which is what people don't talk about, is helping us understand each other because someone who always sleeps well will say, what's their problem? They don't realize how much they're struggling. Mm. And then people that don't sleep well will be like, you're so lucky you can fall asleep all, all the time. And, and learning from each other and also realizing it is a gift to be able to get really good sleep. It's a really nice gift to have if you've got it. Um, and if not, it's a really important one to cultivate more than anything for mental health and biological health on all. Absolutely. Spiritual. Absolutely. So, yes, I look forward to that. It's been so fun. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, you so, so much, much Sabine. It was fun. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll post this out and we can share it and, and share the joy and the wisdom and everything. Right. Okay. See you, you soon. Right. Ciao. See you soon. Bye. Ciao.